Hello, welcome. Today we have Dr. A Amy Cox-Peterson, and she's going to be sharing information about local habitats and GSS standards and remote teaching strategies. Welcome, Dr. Cox-Peterson. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Cynthia. It's great to be with you. I was with um, some of you last week uh, focusing on K through 2, and today's session is grades pretty much 3 through 6. However, it can be adapted for um, lower grades or a little higher, so any of, any of those. Um, so we're going to really look, I, I had, the original title was online teaching strategies, but it's really not. What I'm really, it is, it will be some online, but it's also more remote teaching strategies. So when you're face to face with your kids and um, some of the activities that they will do will be on their own and then they can come back together and share them. And then um, also looking at NGSS, which is the next generation science standards and how they fit in with all of this. All right, so this is our agenda. Um, I will first kind of go through inquiry-based instructions and science process skills that you will want to focus on when you're teaching science. And, and the reason we're setting up these webinars is because many of the, the uh, classes are going to be online um, or remote probably for the next um, upcoming months. And so I wanted to share with you some of the things that I like to do in the classroom, but that can be easily adapted at home and for you to facilitate online. And then again, the next generation science standards, we will look at briefly, and I'll have a link that you can look at that later. And then I like to share some of my um, favorite inquiry-based activities that can be done at home and remotely and online. And then finally, another one of my favorites um, includes the science take-home kit because I believe if you can at all, if, if, if at all possible, if you can create a kit for your students with materials that you know that they can be using um, while they perform certain activities at home, it's wonderful. And everyone has the same kit and so um, you know what you use um, and, and how to use it. And then of course, I just have a few of my favorite resources that I'm sharing as well. Okay, so for science inquiry practices, these are some things, and, and this actually came from a book that I wrote with some colleagues um, quite a few years ago. But we looked at these items such as um, what, what constitutes a science inquiry practice. And it really focuses on observation, huge bit on observation, and even more important, asking questions. Uh, examining from multiple sources, so not just one source, you have to fact check, you know that. You'll see a book that says one thing, you'll see a website that says something else, and another site that says another um, bit of information, and you have to pull them together and really check them. And then also planning for investigations and experiments. Um, investigations are different than experiments, and experiments have things such as um, controls and variables and so forth. And kids th in grades three through six can certainly set up some of these. Using a variety of tools and gathering information and interpreting the findings, also making predictions, proposing explanations, and communicating. You don't just stop, you communicate with others. And so, um, as I said, some of this can be done remotely because you can um, teach observing specifically um, together as a class in a Zoom session or in a Microsoft Teams session. You can do that. You can throw up something such as this here. This just happens to be a sample of, uh, of dirt. And th these are actually, this is actually brick. It's not dirt, but you can see some of the roots here. And, you know, what do you see? And you can ask questions. You can have the students ask questions. And so this can all be done together. And then maybe students have different questions and um, maybe they all investigate different things. Um, from those inquiry practices, we have some science process skills. And I grouped them here. These are more basic skills and these are more advanced skills. So observations are your, your best friend and they're, 
you know, if you teach your kids to use as many of the five senses as they can, they're going to see and hear and on occasion taste, <laughs> um, touch, all of these things provide different information. You want them to note specific details. Um, I really am a fan of getting children into drawing and anyone can draw. I'm gonna show you some things from one of my, my colleagues and how she, um, she actually wrote a book on how to draw uh, California wildlife. And you take basic shapes. And then also looking at differences between scientific drawings and creative drawings. You label things, you describe them, and so forth. So again, observation is huge because what happens is that observation leads to some of these other things. And uh, measuring when possible to be exact. So you can use numbers to count. You can measure, weigh, compare. You don't have to use a uh, standard measurement. You can use how many hands it is. You can use how many feet. Of course, it's only your hand and your feet. And so you can talk about that. Um, and use as many different types of tools that you can to um, get, get measurements. Even though they may not be exact, you can get a really good idea. Uh, classifying creating ways to organize. I'm gonna to talk to you about using a dichotomous key and sorting things into groups. Predicting, and predicting's different than guessing. i just take a guess, you, you know. Predicting's based on more information. So you want the kids to really collect some facts and information before they create a prediction. And some, a lot of times we predict what might happen if we have them engage in an experiment of some sort. And then the more advanced science process skills, such as inference, you're going to take that information and infer things. So if you look outside and you find this little critter and you count the legs and it has six legs, then you're going to say, hmm, I've read that insects have six legs. So I'm going to infer that this is an insect. Now you might not know, know what type it is, but you know by the legs. And if there are eight legs, you might say, well, I know this is not an insect. Hmm, what kind of organism would have eight legs? Usually that might be a spider. So you have a lot of inferences that take place. And then as I talked about the experimenting, what procedures, controls, variables, um, collecting data, documenting information, you can do it as simple as growing a particular plant in three different types of soils. You could have a soil made up of styrofoam. You could have it made up of um, dirt that you dig up from someplace close in your neighborhood. And you could create something else of um, rocks and you decide and you can uh, document what's happening with this particular plant. And so, um, you've got three there and you have three different types. You can do it very basic and you can do it more intricate. And then finally, um, just like I've, I've talked about ob observations being really important, I think it's as important to communicate, to have students actually not just finish, I'm done, but they can do it in so many different ways and it really extends their language with writing, drawing, reading draft, graphs, charts. They can discuss it, they can act it out. I love uh, photos, uh, creating a video of what they're doing. So all these different ways. And all of these things can be shared online. So if you think about it, if every, and, and it doesn't even mean that even with certain observations, you don't have to observe the same things. And I'm gonna show you what I mean there. Um, they can collect objects that are different, but still look at, um, a variety of, of details that relate to that object or that organism. All right, um, and, but however, when you are teaching remotely with these things and with the science process skills and the inquiry, it is most important to communicate with students and families the expectations, the materials, the time frame. And I think if you're going to start off the year with this, you do it early and often. So continue to let them know in advance. 
sometimes students share with their families what the expectations are and sometimes they don't. Families members are very busy as well. So figure out a way to do that and maybe you communicate every Monday or at the end of the week every Friday for what's coming for the following week. I believe it's really important to connect with your students often with their faces. I say faces and smiles and you can share these things. And, you know, if it's a science lesson, you could have something standard, you know, maybe your observation or an intro is on Monday and an observation is on Tuesday and Wednesday, you can come back together and, and you know, share what you found, move and connect. But that I think in every subject to figure out the best way to do it and maybe not the entire school day, but you connect and then you take a break and then you connect and then you take a break. I know that a lot of parents are struggling because they feel they have to be with their kids the entire time. So the most that you can do with students that does not require their parents to be right alongside of them um, is probably going to be to your advantage in most of these. And I think grades three through five should be able to do it um, pretty well. I always advocate for these long-term investigations over time because they focus on depth and not breadth. The depth of understanding is going to help them in so many different ways rather than just very quick activities that, aren't, that are pieced together or maybe not even pieced together. They're just different pieces and they don't see how they fit together. They can also be done in small groups or the whole class. I know in Microsoft Teams, you're able to have small groups, um, Zoom, some others. You can figure out if you wanna have students meet and then you can pop in as a teacher and see how they're doing so you don't have to have a whole group. And then you hold them a little more accountable and they'll feel more comfortable talking. And I see, I'm just gonna call everybody out because I see like Cynthia, Julie, Sophia, um, sorry, I'm calling your names. But you know, most kids now, from what I've noticed, they don't wanna show their faces. And I don't wanna show mine either, so I get it. I mean, I'm doing it today. But if you can encourage them in a way to be on, and maybe they're not showing their faces when you're giving a lecture, I get it. And don't give much of a lecture because you know they're not very old and they're not gonna sit for too long. But maybe you give some information they don't show, but then you say, hey, we're going in our groups, make sure you turn on your video so that they can talk to each other. Also holding some, you know, call them office hours, if you will, or some kind of time with you. You can stay on afterwards and you can say, hey, I'm here for some extra questions. Encourage that. But the long term and sharing as in a variety of ways is going to be um, really important. And then finally, you still um, must clarify these science concepts. You can do it in a variety of ways. You don't even have to do it live. Some of these clarifying concepts can be done in a video. And then you post it and they can look at it when they're able to. I think you're gonna to have to figure out what is the most important time to be on and um, in remote with your kids. And I believe when the kids are actually sharing a lot with you are probably where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. Okay, and that leads me into these NGSS, National Science Teaching Standards. So, the Cal so California's adopted these standards and most states have, not all, but many. And there's a link here, you can find it anywhere, but there are a variety of standards and I think that they, would, they really help guide your science instruction if you go back to them and you say, ah, oh, this is how they were developed because I want you to think about the big ideas within science. And so in the NGSS, there are three areas there are the practices such as the inquiry and doing and performance and the content, which are the actual concepts that the students are going to, to, to um, understand. And then large cross cutting um, big ideas that go within multiple areas of science. So maybe not um, just life science, but they move into earth science and physical science as well. And they, they cut across. And so systems, there are systems in earth science, uh, life science, and physical science. So if you look at systems as a big cross-cutting concept and think of those as you are having these different activities. 
And this is just an example. And you can, you, I just cut and paste this online. This happens to be third grade performance standards. And it does relate to some um, science processes and skills. They have to do things. And this would be to construct an argument. So some animals form groups that help members survive. Hmm. They have to figure out in an argument how that might happen. And so that could be um, you know, working in groups, finding out information from a variety of sources. And then I'm not going to go through all of these, but it just shows other things like analyzing and interpreting data, but they can also collect their own within that. Um, maybe a little less on the inheritance and variation of traits, but um, quite possibly. And so that's how the standards are set up. And if you'll go back and look at these again, I, I think you'll really be happy that you did. Okay, this is one um, that I shared with the K2 group. It's one of my favorites. I think it's really valuable in grades three through five as well. This is called inquiry training. And you show something that puzzles, maybe will puzzle the kids, maybe not. This is something here. And you want students to ask yes or no questions. So I, if I'm the teacher, they're going to ask me questions. You can do this online. You could even do it in the chat. If they don't want to put their microphone on and their audio, they can, you know, ask the question and I can say yes or no. Is it an animal? Yes. Is that skin on its back? Hmm. Yes. Is it a reptile? Yes. Actually, I think these are all yes questions. <laughs> um, but as you can see, there'll be some there yes, some that should be no. And then what you figure out is the kids have to create these. The kids have to think about it. And um, I'll tell you what this is. This is actually our family chameleon. He is much larger now. He was a couple of months old and he was shedding for some of the first time hit a lot of skin and it freaked me out, of course. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at that. And so I just, that's a close up picture. And yes, I took the photo, but have these things. And you know, it could be a warm act activity at the very beginning of your 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 meetings your zoom hey hey this is the yes no you know get have it every day find something interesting and that really works with language so you'll see a lot of this works with language arts as well and then moving into um i labeled it observation classification and a dichotomous key well first of all i have down here Scientists use a dichotomous key to identify organisms such as plants and animals. So what they really do is try to identify different species. And they do this with a key very similar to this one over here. However, you can use it with a variety of objects and things. They can be living, non-living, once living, rocks, shells, all sorts of things. It may be more difficult to get live organisms, uh, you could also have a variety of photos. And so you decide how you want to do that. But it's a wonderful skill that students can uh, start to uh, develop and become pretty good at and to classify things. So you can collect anything. This one happens to be um, on rocks and you have different colors, rough, smooth, dark, light, flat. You can see the different groups here. And I'm going to show you some examples. These happen to be student examples. And you have the rocks, all of these rocks were here. And then the students can actually decide. They can decide how they want to classify. Well, this student said, hey, dark and light, then rough and smooth within that. And then they have some other things. Also, um, a color, more than one color. And um, circular, long, you can see that. So it's, it really doesn't matter how they organize it, but then they get it into everyone has its own place at the end. And so I think you'll find that really important and um, a great skill. And one that you want them to do, not just once, not just twice, but many times. And once they get really good at it, um, you can provide more um, you know, intricate details, some that, are, that look the same color, but really they're not. This is an example also of some rocks that were observed and hopefully most of your kids wherever you live will be able to find some rocks. They're probably one of the things you can find even on a city street or nearby. 
And this happens to be one, these were certain rocks. And you can see the language that was used here and the different colors, the sizes, and you really have to think about what you're observing. And so these are some ideas that you can do. I love using a small hand lens or magnifying glass. Um, make sure there's specific observable words and you don't make um, a leap into what you think it is, but what you actually see. So, um, you know, could this be glittery? Hmm. As long as you can show me that you see something that looks like glitter, I guess I'll, I'll go with that. And do you see how specific this is? It's not just a red, but a salmon red. And so, um, is this crystallized? Hmm, you may have to have them think, are you inferring or did you actually observe it? So um, they can look at each other's. You don't have to look at all of these. You can have them look and share. And that's another time where you can put them into small groups to do so. And then my favorite tool. Um, this is a cell phone microscope and it goes on I'll show you um, during the question and answer session, but I'll just hold this up here. It, it just clips on, just clips on right there. And you, it goes up on your camera lens and it takes the most wonderful close-up photos. So there are some that mag magnify even 90 times. And I don't think this, I think this might be a 60. And if you see here, this is a hummingbird nest. And I don't have different views of it, but it was found in my yard a couple of years ago. And this is the close up. So you can see all the different materials that were used with this nest. I, and I see some paper and some hair and some twigs and some leaves and all sorts of things there. So that's how close um, it gets. And then I'll show you another one, which are owl pellets. And this was actually found really close to my home. If you have your kids, um, some of your third through sixth graders, I don't know um, where they live or if they're able to go out on their own and collect things or go out with an adult or with a sibling, <clears throat> have them create collections. I'm not sure their parents are going to be thrilled, but you know, you can talk about how they organize different, how they can organize it in different ways. And when you find an owl pellet, I find them all the time. We have a an, an, uh, barn owl that is out every evening at dusk and it's just click, 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 click. That's the sound it makes. And we know it's hunting. And let me tell you, it drops the, the pellets too, because, and they actually throw it up. They don't poop it out the other way. It's the, they call it the poop out of your mouth, but it's actually, they um, they digest what they need and the rest they just throw up. And so if you look very closely, you can see some fur um, or I don't see any if these are feathers, it's kind of hard, but definitely some bones are in here. And so it really shows some wonderful things that we used to have to, you know, have that microscope at school that sat on a table that was very expensive. And these, I'll show you some afterwards. You can find them online. They're in the resources. National Geographic has them for about 18 or $19. And then there's another site that I just found. I don't know the company as well, but I, they have them on sale right now for about 13 or $14. All right, and another long-term investigation. So I'm going to move from the close-up to something a little more wide scale and find a tree, any tree, small tree, tall tree, short tree, fat tree, skinny tree. I don't know. It doesn't even matter. It could be a plant. So find something and have them observe. And you'll see I've highlighted these process skills. So you observe it, you make predictions about changes and you start this observation in September and you go through May, June, whenever your school um, is finished. And you might wanna have them make these collections, I don't know, two to four times each month, maybe for um, about nine months. And this is a wonderful way to look over time. And then you're not just going to be looking at the tree, a really important thing would be to look for animals that you see in the tree, look at the ground covering and how that changes because it's part of a larger system within this ecosystem that it's living. And so you're starting to take some of these, just one organism and look at it in um, 
in other ways. So this, these are just some ideas and then you want to have them eventually make inferences, determine how you want them to collect the data, maybe have them propose how they'd like to collect data, how they organize it, and then finally at the end of the year communicate their findings. And it can be through a slideshow, a digital poster, a video, um, however way, whichever way you'd like. But this is a wonderful, and it doesn't have to be a tree, it can be anything, but anything that they can do long term. Ah, something that will come up, you can find. So we call them cookie, we call these cookies. So if they're having their observations of trees, they can now look at the more close up again. This is the wide angle and this is the more narrow and closer to tree cookies. These I actually ordered, you can order them online. However, the best thing to do is to go to a Christmas tree lot around no, the end of November and December and they are cutting tons of tree cookies right there. And they're all different, different trees with different growth rates and they can be used. And so if you have a box for your students that they're going to have, maybe you give them one in September, it's a take home science kit box or kit. Maybe you have another one ready to go in January and you have some of these tree cookies. And again, it helps you to see, so now you're looking at this tree, it may not be the same, but you say, hmm, if you slice the tree, and these were grown as Christmas trees, what does it look like inside? And then you look at the bark, you can see different types of bark. Um, at the Christmas tree light, you probably have a few different types. And this is the cell phone microscope and a close up of two different types of bark. Um, I don't know which one is which actually, but you can see that one has spots in between and it's probably not that one. And I think this one is this one. That's it there. They can observe and look at what's inside the tree that they've been observing. All right, I'm going to tell you a few more of my favorites and how you integrate language. Um, this is old school book. As you know, this is um, Margaret Wise Brown. She is the author of Goodnight Moon, which is you're probably more familiar with. And this one is um, called The Important Book. So what I like kids to do, and they can observe anything that relates to the animal and you could look at it how they work within their environment as well as well or maybe their structure and maybe their function and these are two student examples this one the important thing about a ladybug and I had it here the important thing about a ladybug is that it is red it has black spots it is cute it is small but the important thing about a ladybug is that it is red. So you could take that poem and you could say that is a wonderful poem because that's what it's the same format uh, and structure of the important book. And then you might say, okay, what are actual observations of your ladybug that you saw outside? And hmm, looks red. Okay, maybe you even want to go with a deep red bright red, give it, you know, more specific black spots. Are they actual black spots? Is that the color? Is it cute? Hmm. Could that be debated? Could we say, hmm, something else instead of cute? Could we say it is small, like you said, but maybe use your ruler and estimate about the size. So it is about one centimeter long and a half a centimeter wide. So you, so you, they can write the poem, but then they continue to revise their poems and continue to provide more information that's more scientifically accurate. And then there's one more about a gopher. Um, I'm not positive that these students that I'm giving you examples actually observe the gopher. You could probably, I know in Southern California, observe ladybugs, butterflies, variety of birds, and, um, if it rains, some worms, some pill bugs. But the important thing about a gopher is that it is small. It digs holes, it hibernates in the winter, and it lives underground. The most important thing about a gopher is that it is small. And so again, you would look at this, how small? What are the dimensions? Um, is, there, is the head a certain size? Is the body a certain size? And actually my kids and I on a hike did see a gopher in the last couple of months and we saw him come out of his hole and, and look up. It was um, 
quite interesting. We couldn't see his whole body, but go back through. It is small. It digs holes. How do you know it digs holes? Well, did you look up this information and use multiple sources to determine if that is correct? How do you know it hibernates in the winter? Did you look at one source, two sources? And so you go back through it. So, so the product doesn't have to be the final once they do it. They continue to learn more. Student riddles. Uh, these are some examples of some students. Um, one on the left, I am the only flying mammal in the world. Oh, I see it's can, not cam. Eat over 500 insects per hour. I only hunt at night. I am from the order of Chiropetra. My wings aren't so different from human hands. I sleep upside down, wrapped my wings. What am I? Well, they're talking about a bat. And again, go back, have kids fact checked all of this. Make sure, double check. Um, for it to, to be as scientifically accurate as they can. And then there's another one over here and that has um, more specific information as well. And I think this one is a tarantula on the right side. Favorite books, pull them out, use them, share them. You can even read them aloud. Story time, right? That did not go away. You can do that remotely. So this happens to be the book. I Rock is Lively, beautiful illustrations. It's by Diana Hutz Aston and Sylvia Long. And even on the front, it identifies the different types um, of rocks, minerals. And it said, it starts out, I'll just show you, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, beautiful pictures, but about the third page in, it says, a rock is mixed up. All rocks are made of a mix of ingredients called minerals. Just as a batter of flour, butter, and sugar makes a cookie, a batter of minerals makes a rock. Talks about recipes and so forth. Beautiful book. Um, another one I like is Doodle Dandies, as I'm going to show you some examples, and poems that take shape. And so this is old school one as well uh, by J. Patrick Lewis and images by Lisa DeSimone. There are different things that in this book talks about an eye. So you can see that they are all, they take the shape of the animals or the things. I'll just show you, for example, this is, could be physics and science and a baseball. So all of that. And then the final one are the tracks, scats and signs. Wonderful. I've got a, a resource called Acorn Naturalist that's at the end. I order a lot from their site. And it looks at the different, this is a coyote and it talks about the different um, tracks that are made. I encourage you to have your students as they are outside exploring their local environment to look for tracks. If you are looking for them, you will find them. There's a way that they can actually create a plaster of the track um, at a minimum, maybe photograph the track, video, whatever, um, and try to identify it. And so what does this tell us about um, where they're going, how they're going, how they're moving, um, what's around? And, you know, you might see some tracks and it could be, maybe it's not wildlife, but domestic life. A lot of times you'll see if there are some cats. I know we have a cat in our neighborhood that is out during the day. And a lot of times we'll have the cat paws on our car. So you can see that. It's, and again, the observations and looking at them. Um, and how it works together. So those are some favorites. There are many more. I'm just telling you a few that I have. They're not the only ones at all. These are student drawings related to Doodle Dandies. They made their own um, with a bat. I, don't, well, I am not quite sure what this is. It says, what's its name? And a pincher bug, this one's identified here. Finally, I told you um, how students that I'd share with you, how students can draw. Another favorite. There it is, Plants and Animals, A Field Guide. It's by, um, written and illustrated by Sam Awara. And these relate to um, 60 native California plants and animals. So uh, what Sama does is she shows how easy it is to draw the California dog face. And then she's got the scientific name there as well. And she just starts very basic 
adds things and adds. Same thing with the false indigo here. It, they're a bunch of shapes. And I believe your students will, um, you know, be really surprised that they can draw more than they think they can. At least the ones who say, I'm not, I, I can't draw, I can't draw. Oh, yes, you can. And help them draw more scientifically accurate and look at the differences. And creative drawings are awesome, but scientific drawings are different. And they are based on observations and um, factual information. Oh, this goes along the same one with um, this book. It's, it, it's all with the Art and Wilderness, Art and Wildlife Institute um, and wildlife training cards. I think it's Art and Wilderness Institute. But anyway, um, I may have miss, um, did not write that correctly. Same uh, drawings here. And I encourage you to have your students make their own. So if they are out, and they are looking at a ladybug and they are finding out more about that ladybug and then they look, how is the ladybug important to the environment? Is it important? How about spiders? We see spiders all the time. They're all in our house. Everyone's like, get the spider out, get the spider out. I'm like, oh my goodness, they are eating the things, the pests we don't like in here. They're eating the things outside. How about the owls? They're eating a lot of rodents. There could be many, many more. They could be overrun if they're not out there doing it. Um, Sama within her institute, she has these cards. And I think you can sign up and actually get some of these cards and earn them for your class or your students can earn the cards. So look more onto the um, website and you can see. But if your students create their own cards, they could take a photo or find a photo online and then they draw it and have specific information about it. And then finally, we get to the take home science kits. This is an example. Doesn't have to be this. It can be anything. But what I encourage you to do is think you're going to have to plan long term and think about what you're going to do between September and December. And then you can think about it again and what you're going to do from January on and have a kit that everybody has. So some sample things. I love a trowel. They're about a dollar at the dollar store. And you might be able to order them online for similar. I like containers for measuring, love a ruler, markers, colored pencils, uh, magnifying glasses, index card, the cell phone microscope, if possible, is a wonderful thing. If your school has some funds and are willing for you to put a kit together for the kids. Um, anything you think they can use. And again, things that they can use over and over again. And then some other things they might be able to collect in their homes as well. They can create nature journals. This is one here. This is my daughter's actually. And on the spine it says, I know it's backwards, it says, oh, there we go. Wherever you go, bring your own sunshine. And um, this is, you know, it doesn't have, if, if they make it, I don't know, will they love it more? Maybe, maybe not. But this one's created and I have a picture. There it is there bunch of different poems, pictures, nature. And as you can see, you can't see. Oh, it's right in here. There's a, a place for the pencil here. And you can have paper. This is a rock that's tying that together. Pretty easy. Pretty easy to make and um, wonderful to use as they go out into the field and using recyclable, you know, um, magazines, old magazines, newspapers, different things that they that may be thrown away. So keeping it all together in a nature journal is always a good idea. And then um, as we conclude, just um, I know this was a quick session, but hopefully these are some things that will carry you into your school year and um, things to think about. You don't have to use all these activities, but maybe it, it's a starting point for you to think about what works best for you and your students. And so in conclusion, go back to those NGSS standards. They're wonderful if you look at um, how they were developed and why they were developed within the different grade levels and for the um, three different areas and particularly related to content and inquiry. And of course those cross-cutting um, concepts when possible, focus long term. It doesn't have to be nine months. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, even half the school year. 
but even one week, something that will go into depth and then um, encourage if you're doing certain things, like you're looking at a certain organism, an earthworm, don't just stop at the earthworm. Now look at where the earthworm is living. Why is the earthworm living in this location? What's the function of the earthworm at this location? Ah, oh, looks like. I heard that they're eating some leaves and they eat different things and they decompose and they move around and aerate certain areas. Well, what if I got some grass and leaves and put it on top? Would they take it over time? Would they actually take it down and underground? And I don't know, let's find out. So um, that could even be done in a week. So it doesn't have to be so long, but definitely some that are longer term and not a quick 10 minute activity. I think they're going to be much more valuable. Inexpensive materials. I think I don't have to tell you why. You have a lot of students, if you're going to create a kit for them and they need materials at home, um, you can find wonderful things that do not cost a lot. You don't have to pay a premium cost. When at all possible, integrate these subjects, particularly language arts. It works fabulous with science and then a lot of the measuring related to math and art and other subjects as well. And I didn't even mention music, but obviously that's one too. That's how they can communicate their ideas within a song. Love using the children's book. I introduced you to some of my favorites. That's a starting point. There are so many more that I did not talk about. So I'm sorry to all those wonderful authors that I have a stack full, but I only pulled a few for you today. And then have them share their research and their projects on Zoom, via video, um, and, and try to do it different. You know, you could have them sometimes share them, let them choose how they want to share. And then sometimes teachers like to say, okay, you've got a chart and you need to share in all of these ways at some point during the first semester. So, you know, you expand their brain and you expand their uh, skills in different ways. So if some kid really likes video and I wanna always do a video, but it would be really good if you would also draw or if you would also um, take some photos, or if you would also create a chart and write some information. You want, it, you want to vary their skills, it's, it's to their advantage. And then at the end, some of my favorites, these are just a few. As I mentioned, Acorn Naturalist is the one where I got the track scat signs. They have so many different things. They actually have owl pellets there. They have, um, uh, these stamps that I love that I didn't feature it at, on this webinar, but they're stamps of different tracks of animals as well. And they're, they're a little more expensive, but you can um, order online. Art and Wildlife, it's the Art and Wilderness Institute. See, I told you I was wrong. I'm sorry, Sama, but it's the Wilderness. Art and Wilderness Institute, um, wonderful resources. You can sign up as a teacher and I think receive some of those trading cards and I think your students can too and I'm not quite sure how but I know you can. Um, in South Orange County there's something called the Tree of Life Nursery. It's off Ortega Highway near Casper's um, Park. They have a ton of native California garden. So as a teacher, if you live in this area at all and you wanted to take a field trip and they also have other, um, I think they have strawberries and you can pick strawberries there also, but they will teach you that manzanita Nita tree that was actually the tree that I showed you, how you can observe that's actually on their site and um, lots of native plants and um, a lot of education as well. And finally, the cell phone microscopes. That, the one that I showed you is from National Geographic. I, this, and so all of these are some of my favorites. National Geographic, of course, has a lot of other resources as well. This one I didn't put as my favorite only because I don't know it. And it doesn't look to be a science site, but they do have cell phone microscopes and they seem to be a little bit less and theirs were on sale. So I included that link as well. And then other than that, um, thank you for being um, here today on this webinar. And I hope you um, have some good ideas as you move into the fall.